Sankalp 2013 is looking beyond impact, seeking transformational change. How can transformational change be achieved? What is transformational change for starters? I'm going to pose that question to Anil Sinha, Regional Head, South Asia Advisory Services at IFC. IFC, of course, is the largest development institution focused entirely on the private sector. That was a quick introduction to the IFC for the uninitiated. But when we talk about transformational change, I get stuck at the definition aspect right away. How do you define transformation, Mr. Sinha? For me, the transformation is to create the market mechanism that will enable solve the development problem that we are having. So if it is health or it's education or it's uh, uh, agribusiness, how can we create the entire enabling environment which uses enterprises, which looks at the enabling environment, which looks at financing issues, which looks at implementation issues to create uh, uh, the entire platform for solving a development challenge rather than just looking at what what company has done and measuring what that one company has done in terms of impact. How would you, or where do you see the gaps in this enabling environment, in this market mechanism as we stand today in 2013? The, you know, the glaring gaps. Glaring gaps. If you want to encourage innovation, you have to accept failure. India is one of the co countries where it takes longest to close a business. In Silicon Valley, you can do a project, get angel investing, fail, set up another one, fail, third one, succeed. Here, one is tainted. And how do you create the environment to accept failure? Because the other side of innovation is failure. Every innovator will say that. I mean, that's the first message that they send out. Even the celebrated innovators of more recent uh, vintage, like Steve Jobs, will say you've got to you know, take that failure in your stride on your, on your innovation journey. But uh, there's a recent IFC study, for example, which talks about uh, the huge funding gaps for micro, small, and medium enterprises. I'm going to split this into two parts. You know, one is, of course, many social enterprises that have gathered at, at a convention like, or unconvention like Sankalp, who uh, talk about funding issues. You've captured some, uh, a lot of that, uh, most of that in your report. Um, you know, the numbers are so staggering. Run us through them. And, uh, you know, what's the way forward? So despite all the efforts, our study clearly showed that there's a huge gap, financing gap uh, between the needs of the MSMEs and what the financial sector is providing. Um, we've also made certain suggestions to improve that. And one is, again, to develop the financial infrastructure, uh, which means that the credit bureau should be working much more effectively to give comfort to a lender to lend. Uh, the lender should be evolving more appropriate products for lending to small businesses. Because on the one side, we're hearing that uh, the, the financial institution says we can't really lend, we don't have good projects coming through, and we have the small businesses saying, look, we're we, we really uh, short of funding. Um, funding needs come in really when a company is trying to grow. So in the first round, one can pledge one's collateral, get financing, you set up a business. Then as you grow, uh, you want additional working capital, you want additional financial uh, uh, services that you need, you don't have the collateral to lend. So on what basis uh, can you go to a bank um, and how can that bank get comfort? One is your credit history clearly, so if there's a credit bureau that's working that makes a lot of difference. The other is cash flow lending, a more of a partnership approach, uh, more of the appropriate instruments that you need. Most SMEs uh, go under not because of long-term capital, because short-term capital is not available. They run out of cash. So much more of those kind of products need to be provided. Uh, the, the numbers are still staggering despite everything. And very sobering also. It, it is very sobering, and it also impacts some of the innovative enterprises that are coming in uh, through the inclusive business model space. As they graduate and become small businesses, um, they're, go they're feeling exactly the exactly same heat. Same. You know, so they come within this umbrella yes. sort of credit crunch, if I can call it that. Yes. There's another phenomenon, which is big business turning inclusive, yeah. for lack of a better description. And, uh, you know, from what, pick, uh, what one picks up in conversations, IFC has really played a steering role for some big businesses to have an inclusive uh, agenda. 
you know, uh, is that phenomena, am I flattering you too much at IFC? Is that phenomena really gathering steam beyond IFC's support and partnership as well? I, I think so. I think IFC, apart from our own financing, I like to think also set standards. Um, when IFC invests in a company, there's a sort of a stamp of approval. If IFC moves into a certain sector, it's for the other financial institutions to also seek comfort from the fact that, uh, that, 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 that there is a business out there. And there is a business out there. This entire aspect of large companies driving down into the base of the pyramid, as you know, started with the late C.K. Prahlad's book, uh, Fortune at the, at, at the Bottom of the Pyramid. Uh, but that was looking really at how uh, consumer organizations could sell into the base of the pyramid. Right now, we're talking about shared value creation. You've got to increase the livelihoods along the value chain right to the base of the pyramid if you want that to be a sustainable uh, business model. And that's the area that we're working at. And today, you saw at the G20 Awards, um, the, the panelists, all four, were talking you know, about IFC, both in terms of investment and in terms of advisory, and how we uh, uh, advise them on what kind of business models are appropriate, how to understand the market needs. And one has to make sure that the base of the pyramid uh, is equally benefited from the business. And those are the kind of models that we've been looking at. Some of them are actually going from India into Africa. India is not developing, as the, I would say, as the, as the bastion for innovative businesses now. Two uh, separate questions coming yeah. from your comments. One is, you know, why do large corporations like this need this partnership with IFC when they're catering to the bottom of the pyramid? And the second is, of course, more on the South-South partnership and, and opportunities there. But first question, you know, why, why is it just down to risk sharing? Uh, I think it's a fair question. One is risk because it is a risky proposition. And the second, and as you heard today from the panelists, is advisory services. How we can advise them on developing the business model. Um, we heard from JN Irrigation, how we help them develop uh, the, the JN Gap, which is a global agricultural practice for small and medium farmers in terms of good agri agricultural practices. Uh, there's an international gap. That's a, too far a hurdle. So an Indian standard that can be used, and now JN can use that standard, which is internationally accepted, has become the India Gap, to export uh, products to Japan. So how do we help them develop that uh, business that, that can succeed? Um, we've been working across the supply chain with them, looking at the value chain, improving the productivity uh, of, of the small growers. As you know, in agribusiness, the biggest challenge is, can you make the small grower one hectare owner profitable? If you can make that small grower profitable, you really I've solved the entire supply chain problem. Yes. And that is India's development challenge. And whether you talk about uh, agri-financing, you talk about extension services, you talk about uh, pesticides or whatever kind of inputs, whatever you're trying to do, uh, marketing information is really to make that one hectare small grower profitable. Um, and those are the kind of models that we bring um, to bear when we work with large corporates, um, apart from the financing itself. On a slightly different note, um, you know, you're going to be talking about this at Sankal, but you know, is there scope for a South-South collaboration, whether it comes to impact investing, whether it comes to inclusive business uh, model innovation? I mean, you know, uh, is the collaboration opportunity being overstated? I think there's a huge collaboration opportunity. I think it's been uh, underperforming. Uh, overstated, but underperforming. We haven't seen in as many business models uh, go across. Why? F firstly, models are both important in terms of the business intrinsics, but also there's a cultural issue. Uh, what may work in one state in India is not transferable to another state, let alone between India and Africa. Yes. And, 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 and one country in Africa country, to another country. Another country in Africa. So you've got to look at the cultural sensitivity, look, look at the business and winning environment, and then you need a support organization that can help embed this business model the other side of Africa. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, IFC has the advantage that we work across India and Africa, two huge portfolios for us. Um, so I can use the advisory team that I have, 200 people in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, as my partner as we move across. Some companies, some of the larger companies are already going across. But some of the smaller companies 
are also thinking. For example, Hus Power, you may have heard yes. of this. Hus Power is now thinking of going into, into Sub-Saharan Africa. Whether Hus Power themselves should do this or just the business model should go across and a local African entrepreneur absorb it and embed it is another issue. Because there's also a management stretch that, that comes in uh, when a small business evolves and then goes international. So how do we blend the two? And I think there's a great support mechanism that should be there in Africa, which isn't there. Um, to embed this. I think if India has to play a role in this South, South, Indo, Africa, it has to be in the form of knowledge. It can't be in the form of infrastructure finance. And they have to be receptacles, sound receptacles sound, for that knowledge in Africa. Yeah. Um, one final question is going to sound to you, uh, you know, extremely tedious and practical, but I want to know for Anil Sinha, personally speaking, um, your daily schedule at work, is it going to be more and more focused on getting large corporations to uh, to have an inclusive business agenda, or is it going to be um, you know the advisory services, which is also of course bread and butter for you, if I may say yes. that? So it's, it's been been great innings. As you know, I set up the South Asia Advisory Services. We've, we've gone to a large business now all across South Asia, and before that, I was in Vietnam, Africa. US, etc. But going forward, my interest and my passion is inclusive businesses in India and in South Asia and the South South collaboration and uh, looking both at large corporates driving down and small innovations coming up and really spend more of my time on that and, and look at the entire framework to make this happen going forward. Well, on that note, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it very much. Thank you very much.